As you all probably know, the 9900K is finally available and now that the NDA has also been lifted, we can also finally talk about some benchmark numbers. And as you know, I was in Taiwan two or three weeks ago when we also joined the RTX 2080 Ti battle. And when I was there, we also did 9900K extreme overclockings. We did liquid nitrogen overclocking and also liquid helium overclocking, which you will see at the end of this video once we get there. The choice for our extreme overclocking this time was the Maximum 11 Gene. The Gene is probably the most suitable board for extreme overclocking, especially because it's one DIMM per channel board, so we can achieve much higher memory frequency, achieve much higher performance than, for example, with the extreme motherboard. And the extreme motherboard is more targeted, for example, towards water cooling enthusiasts. That's why we go for the Maximus 11 Gene. You probably also came across those double capacity sticks. Um, quite massive memory sticks actually and it's very interesting that you can now use two of those modules and one module has 32 gigabyte of memory and so we have a total of 64 gigabyte of memory possible on a one DIMM per channel motherboard. I quickly want to point out that obviously this only works on those specific motherboards from Asus and not any other motherboard because there's a very specific way this works. There's also another thing I came across in ASUS ROG which was very interesting and I wanted to show it to you. It's the so-called DIMM expander which I think was the base for those double capacity memory sticks. So basically what they did is making an adapter PCB that can be plugged into the DIMM slots and then you're splitting up the memory lanes to two DIMMs. So basically you have a one DIMM per channel motherboard so Two memory slots only and with those adapters we can plug up to four dims and i think what we saw there with those adapters has been translated into those memory dims in those high or double capacity memory modules which i think is a very interesting idea so you can get kind of the highest performance and small form factor so you only have two memory slots but you can still get up to 64 gigabyte of memory but you should be aware that those sticks only work in those motherboards and you cannot plug, uh, um, for example, four of those into a normal motherboard. It will not work. You will only get half of the capacity. Especially after my dishwasher video, you should probably be aware that we are always protecting our hardware from condensation. So especially in this case, we, when we plan to use liquid helium, we have to be really careful. That's why if you see this mainboard, you can see that this also has been coated into paint in addition. So first we painted the mainboards and then we also put Vaseline on top so we have kind of double protection from condensation. Then we put some paper towel on top to catch any condensation drops or ice, add thermal paste and then add the liquid nitrogen container and we're pretty much ready to go. The 9900K is very similar to the 8700K except that the 9900K or the 9th Intel Gen is soldered. It's kind of interesting and I will post another video in probably several hours or maybe tomorrow. I'm not sure when exactly it will be finished. But um, for at least for extreme overclocking, the solar team is really interesting. But there are some downsides which I will explain in a separate video. So I will not go too much into details. But for extreme overclocking, this time we did not have to delete the CPU. We just went full out without any additional modifications. Since the 9900K does not have a so-called fiber, so it doesn't have the Intel voltage regulator, we can go full pot. So there is no problem running liquid nitrogen at, for example, minus 180, minus 190 degrees Celsius, just as low as we can go. These extreme overclocking events require a lot of preparation and also pre-testing. So it's not only me who went there, there are also additional overclockers. So for example, we have Alex from Romania who has been there also for the previous events. Then we have Stavros from Greece and we have Roberto from Italy. So Roberto and Alex are both pretty much overclockers who are aiming for 2D benchmark results. Um, Alex more like Cinebench results or uh, GPU Pi, while Roberto is also focusing on Cinebench, Geekbench and some of the 3D marks. And Stavros especially is a, a big fan of the legacy 3D benchmarks. So he still, even now in 2018, he loves to bench 3D Mark 2006, which still scores extremely high using a 9900K. And then we had another legend in our team. It's Freddy Yama from Japan. He has been in the extreme overclocking scene for about 20 years. He's probably one of the first guys who ever did extreme overclocking um, of computers with liquid nitrogen or dry ice. So he has a massive amount of experience and he loves to bench Super Pi benchmark. Even now, 9900K, he still loves to bench 
the CPU in Windows XP just to see if he can beat his previous score. Absolute great man, I'm very happy and uh, very thankful that I had the chance to meet this guy. So first I did some basic testing on liquid nitrogen because I wanted to see how the 9900K is affected by temperature. So basically I fixed the CPU to 5 GHz and 1.40 volt. I mounted an LN2 container and poured down the LN2 container in steps to see how the temperature itself without any additional voltage affects the frequency and especially also the power consumption. In this graph you can see the power and frequency scaling of the 9900K over temperature. So the bottom axis is showing the LN2 container temperature which you can see goes from plus 50 to minus 60 degrees Celsius. Plus 50 is actually pretty much on the edge because plus 50 degrees Celsius pot temperature equals about 80 to 90 percent core temperature and that's what you can see also in the frequency scaling that I was not able to push the CPU really high um, as long as I was kind of in the temperature limit at 50 and 40 degrees Celsius pot temperature. So once I hit 30 degrees Celsius on the LN2 container you can see I could achieve a maximum frequency of 5600 megahertz and then I could go up to 6.1 gigahertz at minus 60 degrees Celsius. You can see there is a 500 megahertz scaling from plus 30 to minus 60 which is really impressive and we can also see from here and what we can also translate from there is if we go from a 30 degree to a 20 degree Celsius water block, we, incre we can increase the core speed by 50 megahertz, which is actually quite impressive. What is even more impressive is that if we go from plus 50 to minus 60 degrees Celsius, we lower the power consumption from about 250 to, uh, to 175 watt. So we lowered the power consumption by 75 watt by lowering the temperature. So a massive cooling unit, of course, can be worth it if you want to overclock your 9900K to the edge. A custom water cooling loop is still the way to go. So after we did the basic testing, I sat down with Alex from Romania and we wanted to compare the 8700K to the 9900K extreme overclocking results. So back then when we did the 8700K extreme overclocking, we pushed the CPU to 6.8 GHz at 1.75 volt which achieved a Cinebench R15 score of 22.53 points and in multi-threading and a single-threaded result of 299 points and a maximum validation of 7312 MHz. Now the 9900K has exactly the same single core speed, so the single-threaded performance at 6.8 GHz in R15 is the same at 299 points while the multi-threading speed increases drastically to 2913 points which was kind of expected by adding two more cores and a bit more cache. Validation also increased on the 9900K even though we have two additional cores we could increase the validation to 7484 MHz which was the highest I could achieve using liquid nitrogen and I think that's mainly the result of the CPU being soldered but of course it could also be that the CPU was just a really really good sample. We also checked the power consumption in Cinebench R15 multi-threading which was 318 watt peak roughly at uh, 6.9 GHz and the score in Cinebench R15 was almost 3000 points. So what's really interesting is that compared to strong ambient overclocking where we can expect something like 240-250 watt power consumption, the power consumption in LN2 overclocking is not much higher. It's just that the low temperatures really help to decrease the power consumption so we almost end up at the same power consumption in the end as using massive ambient overclocking. So after three days of preparation and pre-testing we brought out the big toys. So we ordered two tanks of liquid helium, 100 liter each and one tank I think is about 3000 USD. So it's really expensive so we had to make sure that everything is really well prepared that we know exactly which CPU can run at which temperature and at which voltage setting and in which benchmark. The first setup was my setup which was meant for CPU-Z validation. So we just wanted to see how high can we push the CPU with all cores and hyper-threading active. Basically just ramp up, ramp up the clocks while also keeping control of temperature and voltage. Voltage was about 2 volt for the validation itself and the temperature was about minus 220 to minus 225 degrees Celsius. If we went lower in temperature, lower than minus 225 degrees Celsius, 
the USB controller wouldn't work anymore, so I wouldn't have control over keyboard and mouse. That's why we had to move over, while we were running with Liquid Helium, we had to move over to a PS2 keyboard. That's also the reason, or one of the reasons, why those extreme overclocking mainboards, like the Maximus 11 Gene, still have a PS2 port. Because in some conditions, especially if we use uh, Windows XP, we still need PS2. But after roughly 10 minutes, we achieved a maximum clock of 7613 megahertz, which is almost 300 more than on the 8700K. And I think it's the fastest Intel Core series CPU ever. Afterwards, we moved over to Roberto's rig, which was meant for PFAST. And PFAST is a single threaded benchmark, so we can disable some cores in the BIOS to lower the power consumption, which essentially allows us to run a little bit higher clocks. We were using three cores active on the CPU and Roberto pushed the CPU to 7.5 GHz across the three cores and then he ran the PiFast benchmark, achieved a score of 8.39 seconds, which is also a new world record in PFAST. In the end, we moved over to Alex's system, which was prepared for Cinebench R15, which equals some heavy multi-threading load and pushing the CPU to 7 GHz at 1.8 volt is extremely heavy and it produces so much power that even with liquid helium it's very hard to keep up with the temperature. So basically the, the CPU produces more heat than what we can remove with the liquid helium. So first we have to go down to minus 220, minus 230, as low as we can go to have the cooler buffering a little bit of the heat and then we can fire up the benchmark and yeah, we managed to do it and the score was 3,123 points in the end in Cinebench R15. Liquid Helium is actually quite tricky and a lot more difficult to handle than liquid nitrogen. So liquid nitrogen we can just put in a thermos and pour it into the container, but liquid helium is a lot different. For liquid helium we have the container, so we have the UR itself which contains 100 liter of liquid helium. And then we have a gas bottle standing next to it, also with helium. And the gas bottle is pressurized and we use this pressure of the liquid helium gas bottle to push out the liquid helium out of the 100 liter tank. And then for, therefore we have a hose one guy has to handle and then we, have, we need one or two additional guys to handle the UR and the pressurized tank. So yeah, we need at least two or three people just to handle one liquid helium rig. So it's a lot more work, it's a lot more difficult than just using liquid nitrogen. What you can also see is that liquid helium produces so much smoke because it's so cold and we have to remove this cold air from the systems, otherwise they're freezing up so quickly and we encounter so many issues so fast. That's why we have those fans placed around the rigs. And we also had at Alex system one fan placed on top of the PSUs. Actually my PSU and his PSU were under it. Those were Asus ROG Thor PSUs. And as you can see, one of the PSUs was completely frozen up in the end. It was still working, but I think it was really on the edge because the fan was basically melting a lot of the ice and then a lot of the water was dropping down onto a PSU. And especially after my dishwasher video, you probably know that I'm not really afraid of putting water onto hardware, but um, yeah, having water dripping down to your PSU, which is plugged into 220 volt, that's a different story. So we quickly had to unmount the system, put everything down and uh, made sure that everything is still alive, but everything was still working, even though the PSU and the whole rig was completely frozen. In the end, we managed to break six world records with the 9900K, which is quite impressive, and we broke uh, I think 11 global first places and a global first place is a record in a specific category. So for example, the eight core category where the 9900K would be compared, for example, with a 2700X or with a 7820X. So in total, a lot of very impressive results and the CPU can clock extremely high on liquid helium and also on uh, liquid nitrogen. But as you will notice, if you see all the other reviews, the 9900K cannot clock extremely much higher than an 8700K on ambient, especially because the CPUs are running really hot. Um, why that is, you will see in one of my next videos until that. If you have any questions about liquid helium, liquid nitrogen, anything like that, put it down in the comments below. See you soon.